Good morning and shalom. It may not be morning when you're listening to this, but it's it's morning when I'm uh, taping it for you. And uh, it's an interesting morning. We've had some snow here, probably where you are as well. <clears throat> and today we're looking at the seventh chapter of Sefer Daniel, Daniel's vision of the end of days. This is exciting material. It's it's about the future. It's about our future, the future of our people. And it's important that we look at this, that we uh, examine it, read it, study it, and think about it. Think about what is happening in our world today uh, in terms of also what will be happening. So Daniel's first vision, this, this is a dream, and it occurred during the first year of Belshazzar's reign, approximately 553 BCE, which is 14 years before the fall of ba- Babylon. So this, this is before the last chapter, the chapter um, that we looked at last week, um, which talked about the fall of Babylon. Now, 14 years before the fall of Babylon, this is three years after Nabonidus became the king of Babylon. And we know that Belshazzar reigned with him. The events of chapter 7 chronologically fall between chapters 4 and 5, so obviously considerably considerably before chapter 6. Daniel consciously set the visions in an historical background. That is, he set it in 6th century Babylon. Daniel 9, 1, and 2 supports the historicity of this book and its author relating to the prophecies of Yermiahu. So we know that Daniel um, lived after Yermiahu, that he was familiar with the prophecies of Yermiahu, that in fact um, many of these have been made, or perhaps all of them, during his lifetime. Chapters 10 and 12 are uh, are in the third year of Cyrus. Um, Belshazzar's third year, chapter 11, Darius's first year. So a little confusing, but um, try and think about that as we're looking at it. Until the days of modern criticism, higher criticism, it's called. Higher criticism began in uh, mid-1800 Germany. Um, Up until that time, all students and scholars, whether they believed that the scriptures are the word of God or not, accepted the historical and futuristic character of Daniel, with the one exception of Porphyry in the third century, who invented a pseudo-Daniel, who apparently, he thought, lived in the second century. And, of course, these higher critics picked up on the one out of all the those who, who wrote about Daniel, the one person who didn't agree that Daniel was set in history. The preceding chapters have established for us Daniel's credentials as God's prophet. He is a man of God, a man that God has used to prophesy. And we begin that with chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's forgotten dream of the image with the head of gold. Chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of his fall. 
the seven years of insanity and his reinstatement after he acknowledged God's supremacy. Chapter 5, The Handwriting on the Wall, Predicting the Fall of Babylon, and Chapter 6, of course, Daniel in the Lion's Den, Daniel's relationship with God and his protection by God. Daniel's vision, the vision of chapter 7, was given to him as a dream while he was sleeping. <clears throat> now, uh, visions could be given in different ways. And so this is specifically described as a vision given in, in a dream. Verse 2 describes the great strife taking place on earth, mostly representative of the strife of Gentile history, the strife among the nations, in other words. We have more of this in uh, Yeshiahu 17 and 57 and Yermiahu chapter 6. The great sea that is described here may be the Mediterranean. Um, similar references in Bamidbar 34, Yahashua, um, various places in Yahashua, and Yechezkel 47 and 48. Whether or not it is the Mediterranean, the sea is identified with this earth, as in the Sea of Politics, for example. Possibly uh, it's talking about the activity from which the beasts or the beasts will arise. So it could be politics, it could be business, it could be a number of things. The winds of heaven signify the power and forces of God. There are four winds. We talk about four corners of the earth, um, and both of these. Um, descriptions are of all peoples. They are of the Goyim, the nations. The sovereign power of God is shown to be in conflict with sinful humanity, as of course we know from other places in scripture, such as Bereshit 6 and Yochanan 3. Out of the sea, come four beasts. Now, we know that their place of origin is the sea. Again, could be the Mediterranean, or perhaps it could simply be describing um, a realm of, uh, of endeavor, such as politics, so on. Uh, see, this, this term in Hebrew means to be agitated or tumultuous. And it was used to refer to the area of the then known world, which was constantly filled with wars, one empire seeking to throw overthrow another, and of course doing so. This might be a sort of double entendre, uh, referring to the Mediterranean Sea, that is the area of the Mediterranean, the area of the world from which the four empires would arise, or the world of politics people of different laws and customs. The first beast is Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. Again, you can go back to chapter 2 and see Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the image. Um, this beast is described as like a lion with eagle's wings. The lion, of course, is the king of beasts, and the eagle is the king of the air. So both represent royal power. Winged lions were used to guard royal palaces in Babylon. Lions, in fact, were the most popular animal in Babylonian art. So we see, for example, the lion gate and lions at the palace of Sargon II. Um, you can see some of Sargon's palace in the British Museum, as a matter of fact. The king of Babylon is likened to a lion. Uh, Yermiahu and Yeshiahu also use this 
description, and also to an eagle. Again, Yermiyahu and Yechezkel both use this description. But at one point, the wings are removed, and this removal of the wings indicates Nebuchadnezzar's experience of chapter 4. His uh, insanity and demotion, but it may also be interpreted as describing Babylon's uh, eventual fall, which we also read about in this book. The second beast is the Medo Persian Empire under Cyrus. And it is described as being like a bear. A bear is powerful, but considerably less exalted and majestic, also known to be cruel and bloodthirsty or ferocious. The Medes and the Persians were actually known for their cruelty and as robbers and spoilers. And we're told that it raised up itself on one side. The Persian half of the empire was exalted over the Median half. Cyrus, of course, was Persian. And it had three ribs in its mouth. The bear had already devoured the peoples of Medea, Persia, and Babylon. And the command comes, arise, devour more flesh. These are the conquests by the Medea Persian Empire after the fall of Babylon. And they included Lydia, Egypt, and other places as well until the time of Alexander the Great in 336 BCE. The third beast is, of course, the Macedonian Empire under Alexander the Great. Alexander and his empire are like a leopard. The spots denote the individuality of the conquered nations, unlike Previous empires, um, they sought to be a kind of union of nations rather than an amalgamation which would have one identity. Swift as a leopard describes uh, Alexander very well. Alexander's conquests took only 12 years, including all of Asia, to the Ganges River and part of Europe. This was an unprecedented accomplishment. But the leopard is less majestic than a lion and not as powerful as a bear. Four wings of a fowl. It means that um, Alexander was twice as swift as Babylon, but not like an eagle. So speed is emphasized, and four heads, four governmental divisions resulted when Alexander died at the age of 33, and these are Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. They were his generals. Dominion is given. God allowed Alexander to conquer the nations from Greece to India. With only 30,000 men, he overcame Darius, the Mede, with 600,000 men. The fourth beast is Rome. Rome is described as dreadful and terrible. Beginning in 241 BCE, with the occupation of Sicily, Rome swept through Macedonia, Pergamus, Syria, Egypt, Jerusalem in 630, uh, 63 BCE, conquering Spain, North Africa, Asia Minor, Greece, and extending Rome's dominion into Britain, France, Belgium, Switzerland, and the German states.
it grew gradually over a period of four centuries. Its zenith was in 117 CE, and it declined slowly beginning in the third century, leaving Britain in 407, sacked by the Visigoths in 410 CE. The last ruler was killed in 1453 when Muhammad II took Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Empire of Rome. All subject nations were broken and crushed under the foot by Rome. Totally different from the way other empires had treated their subject people. It was diverse from all. It is unique. And it had ten horns. In Hittigalut, this is described as ten toes. We see the resurrection of the Roman Empire in some form at a future time. And of course, there have been many debates about what this would be and if it's already come about. And then we have a change of focus. The focus now is on the Ancient of Days. Hashem Almighty himself. And this is the only place in the scriptures where he is specifically represented in human form, in a form that human beings can actually comprehend. His throne is placed, it's established, it's erected. That's the opposite of being cast down. As if for the convocation of the Sanhedrin, where the leader sat with his judges around him in a semicircle, and the people stood before him, he is surrounded by angels. His appearance suggests absolute purity and eternality. And you might compare this with Yeshua's appearance in Hittigalut 1 when he appears to uh, Rav Yochanan. We're told that his, th his throne is a burning flame. Uh, you may be reading like in your translation, but this is not in the original Aramaic. So his throne is a burning fl flame, and the unknown wheels are also burning. Of course, the wheels are described in Yekeskel 1. This picture represents the awesome glory and righteous judgment of Hashem, as described in Tehillim 97, verses 2 and 3. Ministering to the Ancient of Days are countless tzaddikim, righteous ones, and angels, and they are there in preparation for the coming judgment. The scene is set during the final moments of human history, the time of final decision for the peoples and the nations of the earth. The last moments are ticking by. Individuals will be tried on the basis of their relationship with God through Mashiach Yeshua. The nations will be tried according to their treatment of the nation and people of Israel. I don't know that any nation will fare very well in that judgment. We're told that the books were opened. These books are a record of ungodly deeds. This is not the book of life in which these people have no part. On the basis of what is written in this book, people will be judged by God. Similar references in Hittigalut 20, Yeshiyahu 65, and Malachi 3. 
according to Matityahu 25, verses 31 through 46, the judgment of the nations that is recorded in Daniel will precede the establishment of Mashiach's kingdom and will extend afterwards to the entire world. Again, read to Helim 97. And of course, we see the destruction of the beast. <clears throat> the scene that is set is one that is celestial. Preparations have been made for the judgment. The courtroom is arranged. The judge is in his place, Hashem. The scene on earth is viewed by the judge for all of human history because, of course, Time really doesn't exist for Hashem. Now, he will declare his dominion, taking power away from Hasatan and his creation, the false Messiah, the beast. Even as the beast boasts, he is overtaken and brought to judgment. The sentence is, above all, just, because that is God's character. In light of the beast's evil activities, which are described later, the consuming fire of God's righteous wrath and pure judgment will destroy the beast quickly and suddenly. In Hittigalut 19, verse 20, we read, but the beast was taken captive, and with it, the false prophet, who in its presence had done the miracles which he had used to deceive those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped its image. The beast and the false prophet were both thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. This passage is interpreted by those who view all prophet as all prophecy as historical, that is, in the past, as reference to Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, 164 to 165. The problem with this solution is that the kingdom of God was not established when Antiochus ruled or even thereafter. Indeed, the victory of Antiochus was insignificant in the light of the Roman conquest only a hundred years later. The fourth beast is irrevocably destroyed, while earlier beasts merely continued in their successors, um, succeeding empires. But this one is the end. It's the end, the end of time as we know it. And thus we come to the fifth kingdom. Mashiach, son of man, this term used of Yeshua frequently in the Ketuvim of Meshachim, is brought before the Ancient of Days to be installed in his kingdom. <clears throat> in the same way that, for example, David installed Solomon as the ruler of Israel because he is worthy. That's what we're told about him. Unlike others who have ruled, Mashiach is worthy to rule. Mashiach ben David is the king by right. He is given absolute dominion forever to rule in the Father's name. And thus, Hasatan's position as prince of this world is forever ended. God intervenes in human history once again, this time to introduce into human history the state of being which already exists in heaven. As Yeshua used the Amidah 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Mashiach's kingdom will not share the fate of the four kingdoms before it. It is indestructible. It is an extension of the spiritual kingdom, which already exists. Daniel was greatly troubled by his vision because he had seen terrible events and he did not fully comprehend their meaning. And so he questions an angelic being in in his vision and was first given a, a general interpretation of the four kings and of the final kingdom. This kingdom will be possessed by all followers of Hashem through the ages, all of the tzaddikim, the righteous ones of all ages. They will take the kingdom under the command of King Mashiach. The continuity of this kingdom begins in the hearts of the righteous, and it extends through Mashiach's thousand-year reign on earth into the eternal reign of God after the judgment of the wicked. The fourth unique beast was described to Daniel, explained to Daniel, after his specific inquiry. And this is what he's told. It will devour the whole earth, overwhelming and destroying. The ten horns are ten kings, three of which will be subdued by an additional little horn, another ruler, not a king. The little horn will be the outstanding personage during the end of days. He will blaspheme God and persecute those who are faithful to God. He will attempt to alter religious observances which directly honor God in the same way that Antiochus did, but with much greater power. He will be allowed these powers by God for three and a half years. And I saw a beast come up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. On its horns were ten royal crowns, and on its heads blasphemous names. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, but with feet like those of a bear and a mouth like the mouth of a lion. To it the dragon, Hasatan, gave its power, its throne, and great authority. One of the heads of the beast appeared to have received a fatal wound, but its fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth followed after the beast in amazement. They worshipped the dragon, Hasatan, because he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? It was given a mouth speaking arrogant blasphemies, and it was given authority to act for 42 months. So it opened its mouth in blasphemies against God to insult his name and his Shekinah and those living in heaven. It was allowed to make war on God's holy people, that is Israel, and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Hittigalut 13, 1 through 7. The Roman Empire, in whatever form, will be revived under this individual by the power of Hasatan. Clearly, this is the false messiah of Hittigalut. Daniel's interpreter confirmed the judgment of the fourth beast the utter destruction 
of his kingdom. In contrast to the ungodly rule of the fourth beast, the kingdom will become the possession of all the righteous ruled over by Hashem and his king, Mashiach Yeshua. Again, from Hittigalut, this time chapter 5, And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and on the sea, yes, everything in them, saying, To the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb belong praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever, for eternity. The key to a futuristic interpretation of this chapter is Israel. Just as our Jewish people have been reestablished in their own land according to prophecy, so will all of these things be fulfilled. Read Yeshiahu 62, verses 4 through 7. And this is what it also says in Yeshiahu 61. For as the earth brings forth buds, and as the garden causes the things that are sown to spring forth, so Adonai Elohim will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. We do not need to fear what is coming. So many times people read these things and they're anxious. Well, God tells us not to be anxious for anything, that he is with us and he will take care of us. He will meet all of our needs. Whatever's coming and We don't know in what form it will come or how it will come. We do know that it will, this power will have control of the whole earth in no uncertain terms, and that this power will blaspheme Hashem. He will blaspheme Hashem. He will do miracles. He will do amazing things. Perhaps, perhaps he will bring a kind of peace to the world. We know it. It isn't in a state of peace at the moment. But we don't need to be afraid. And we don't need to fear the kinds of things that people talk about, like the mark of the beast, because we belong to Hashem. We belong to Hashem. It's as simple as that. He will not allow anything to harm us in that way, because we have a relationship with him in which we are united with him. He cannot be separated from us. We cannot be separated from him. And therefore, whatever comes, he will be with us and he will take care of us through it. Maybe difficult times very possibly will be because we know that there there already is a growing um negativity towards Israel, uh, as there has been for some time, but also towards anyone who follows God. It's so much easier in the world we live in today not to do that, not to follow God, not to obey his commandments, not to live as we're told to live in Torah. All of those things are much easier for us to just gloss over and say, well, it doesn't really matter. Little things, you know, like eating in a halal restaurant. Oh, it's okay. You know, I'm not going to eat any meat anyhow. It doesn't matter. You're making a statement about what you believe and what you think is right. We, We need to be careful to follow the commandments of God, but not anxious because God says we should never be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. And always remember that what God is bringing to an end through this time, through the difficulties that we may face, all of this 
is so that our God can establish righteousness and praise throughout the earth. We're told that even the, the trees of the field will clap their hands and we'll all go out with joy. All of those who love God, that is our future, our hope, our assurance from Hashem. I hope you continue to have a good week. Whatever is happening in your life, my prayers are with you. And please, if you want to talk about anything, including Daniel, please give me a ring or email me. I'm always happy to hear from any and all of you. God bless and keep you.